Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is April 20th, 2016. And here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, will an Austin gay pastor become the Tawana Brawley of cakes? It's the icing on the cake as he tries to make himself look like the victim of a hate slur. Whole Foods countersues as in-store footage exposes the fraud. And felony and misdemeanor charges have now been filed against three state and city workers in Flint, Michigan, related to the Flint water crisis and a conspiracy to tamper with evidence. Then, in the New York primary, a Bernie voter finds he can choose Bernie over Hillary, but when it comes to selecting delegates, he's forced to choose a Hillary delegate. Pick one, vote for one. Delegates for the National Convention. There are six delegates for Hillary Clinton, and there are five delegates for Bernie Sanders. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. It was just last night, and myself and David Knight, we were sitting here and we were talking about all the politicians who are fine with sanctions and surveillance and other things on the American public, but they don't like it on themselves. One in case in point is Dianne Feinstein. And it reminded me, uh, I saw that clip, I think it was on 60 Minutes, they were talking to Feinstein. And she was saying, yeah, I was fine with them doing all these things until the surveillance came to me. And then somebody actually flew a drone. Uh, it is a little private drone, but a drone up to her window and it was looking at her and she wasn't okay with that. Well, Mrs. Feinstein and anybody else who signs these uh, documents and legislation, I'm not fine with this document I have right here. And it says, court troubled by surveillance excesses at the FBI and the NSA. In a just released court opinion, a federal court judge overseeing government surveillance programs said he was extremely concerned about a series of incidents in which the FBI and the NSA deviated from court-approved limits on their snooping activities. Perhaps more disappointing than the NSA's failure to purge this information for more than four years was the government's failure to convey to the court explicitly during that time that the NSA was continuing to retain this information the judge wrote. And that's exactly right. Not only are they saying they're not getting rid of this information like they say that they are going to do, they're just pretty much lying to the court or they're lying by omission. They're not flat out lying, but they're just trying to kick the can down the road and hoping that people will forget about it. And the judge is like, no, you guys aren't being forthcoming with this information. And that's what's very troubling because you think about these huge data centers they have. They have one in San Antonio, I believe one in Utah, which is the largest. And when you think about all this metadata and then you compare that to... Uh, the things that they're actually supposed to stop, right? They're supposed to stop the terrorist attack. That's why we have these big data mining centers, or at least that's what they tell us. But you think about San Bernardino, you think about uh, the other things that have happened here in this country, attacks on NSA centers that they could not predict with all this information. Why? Because they ingest so much information that they can't pinpoint down to the people who are the actual threats. It's like you got all this, it's, it's like you have a, a bucket a bucket of sand, right? And you're trying to find a grain of rice. Well, you can't find the grain of rice because you have so many other things in there that are distracting you from finding the grain of rice. It's the same thing with the information. And of course, they're keeping these things data, uh, data mined, cataloged in their servers. If you guys watch a show, like I like watching true crime shows. You watch something like uh, 48 Hours Mysteries or, or any of these other crime shows. Anytime the bad guy does something bad and then they want to go track back his information, they show you explicitly how they looked at their, uh, their cell phone records, their emails, their Facebooks, all these other things to, to paint the profile of the person that they wanted to see. And you may say, fine, that's well and good if they're going after the bad guy. But you have to remember, before the guy committed the crime, they were still taking tabs on all the things in his life. And it's the same, same thing for you and I. Just be aware of that as they continue to very unconstitutionally uh, take your information. You can't just say, I want a warrant for everybody in the United States of America and that'd be granted to you. No, that's not constitutional at all. And as we're talking about surveillance, it was the surveillance system at Whole Foods that actually saved their bacon, so to speak. Uh, there's an incident right here in the city of Austin where a uh, pastor had a fake claim, or at least uh, that's what Whole Foods is saying, and I do believe they are correct. Basically, a guy goes to Whole Foods, he purchases a cake, he's a gay man, and that is relevant to the conversation here. And he says that uh, when he gets out to the car, he realizes that there's a uh, anti-gay slur on his cake. Now this immediately threw up a red flag for me and many other people, if you go watch the videos or the comment sections on the videos on uh, YouTube, they note that 
this guy went out and bought a cake with lettering on it, and he didn't check while he was in the store to see what the lettering was. It's like if you have a son named Tim, aren't you going to check in the store to make sure that your cake doesn't say John? Things like that. He didn't buy any candles or milk or anything with it. So there's a lot of things wrong with this from the jump. And also, if you watch the video of this incident, or the transaction when he was checking out at the uh, counter, you'll notice that the clerk scans the top of the cake, and that's very relevant because if you watch the video, when the man goes to the checkout counter at Whole Foods, the clerk scans the top of his box, uh, the cake box, which is very relevant, as you can see right here in the footage. And this is interesting because by the man's own testimony, he had a tag on the bottom of the box, which is to say if he went through the checkout line as he is saying that he did, that means you would have to flip the cake upside down and walk out the store with it. I'm not buying that and neither are the people at Whole Foods and there's more to that. Uh, there's a video also of the man and his uh, testimony. Long story short, Whole Foods is suing the man and his legal team and I hope they win every dollar they can from the guy. I believe they're suing him for $100,000. And this is just one of many fake falsified reports. Is there real bigotry, sexism, whatever else you want to call it out there based on race or sexual orientation or uh, religion, any of these things? Of course there are, but these guys are defeating their own cause when they do stunts like this. And he's not the only one. We see this, another hate crime hoax. And this was a student, a black student at Keene University. Basically, she was running around uh, putting out all this uh, anti-black rhetoric on social media trying to stir up the other students and it came out that that was a hoax and she said she did did this because she wanted to have a racial social justice rally but she didn't think people would come if they weren't scared enough to go to the rally it's like when kid and i went out to uh, i believe it was the university of missouri and uh while we were there it, there was another student who was uh, putting out something on social media a, a black student i believe it was saying that the clan is coming to campus it turned out to be a total hoax it's like these guys are defeating the own their own purposes when they do these stunts but uh whether it's this or you know the couple the gay couple that spray painted their own garage there's no shortage of people who are willing to just make up stories and it's not even like a uh blown out of proportion or, you know, this is my view, this is your view. These are completely fabricated stories to help their cause and they're just hurting it a whole lot more. And as we're talking about people on social media, social media can actually hurt you physically. We have this report here about people who suffer various cell phone injuries, as bizarre as that may sound to some people. Uh, you can get everything from tech neck to uh, Blackberry thumb to uh, cell phone elbow. These are real elements. Uh, people have to go to doctors and get braces and all kinds of things. Uh, you got the text neck, uh, people craning their necks. I'm sure you guys have seen many people like this, uh, especially among the young people. They say you can also get that from wearing a back pack, uh, cell phone pinky, uh, all types of uh, weird things. So just be aware of that when you use your cell phones and your electronic devices. Now that's some lighter news, but we still have some more hard hitting news. You guys recall the situation that's going on in Flint, Michigan, the poison water up there, the poison in your tap water. Everybody said, yeah, you guys are being sensational. Like, uh, it's not sensational now. Now is it? Uh, the Michigan governor has said he's going to drink Flint water every day for the next month, how they're going to make sure that he's getting his water from Flint. I don't know, but that's what he says he's going to do. And now they're saying they're actually filing criminal charges against three state and city workers. Felony and misdemeanor charges have been issued against three state and city employees in connection to the city's water crisis. One is accused of tampering with evidence when he allegedly changed testing results to show that there was less lead in city water than there actually was. He was also charged with willful neglect of office. And we see others are charged with uh, misconduct in office, conspiracy to tamper with evidence, tampering with evidence, a treatment violation of the Michigan Safe Drinking Water Act, and a monitoring violation of safe drinking water. So these are things that you have to be aware of because they're not gonna tell you till it's too late think about this, this did not make national news until after people started dying. Uh, there are people actively, as we see in these allegations, in these reports, trying to keep this thing under wraps, whether you can justify it by saying that maybe they're trying to uh, stop a public panic. It doesn't matter if you try to put a wrap on it, if you know young children and infants are dying, people need to know what's in their drinking water. And of course, you're not gonna know till it's too late. Now they have these publicity stunts, the governor says he's gonna drink the water. Uh, but I'm very curious to see if people of Flint, you guys put out those videos when this first 
uh, came out in the news stream of you know, the, the dirty water, the brown water. If you guys still have dirty water at this day and age, make more YouTube videos. Uh, send it to us, show tips at InfoWars. I'd love to see if they've actually cleaned up the water out there, how clean it is. You can use uh, various uh, testing supplies. We sell some of them here in the InfoWars shop to test your water and just let us know how it's going out there. And it's not just Flint that has a health crisis because it's not just the water, but everything we ingest, everything we breathe, including our air supplies. And if you live in the state of California, unfortunately for you, the results are out. You have some very dirty air. And they say most Americans live in areas with unhealthy levels of air pollution, a study finds. And they say if you go out to Los Angeles, Long Beach areas, they top the list compiled by the American Lung Association for most ozone polluted areas in the nation. You also have Bakersfield at number two and Fresno at number four. And they say that eight out of 10 residents, 32 million people live in counties with unhealthy levels of ozone. So definitely take this into account because you see those videos, you go to China or other places and you see, see those people walking around with the surgical mask. I don't know how long it's going to be until things get that way here. Hopefully they won't, but uh, with all the pollution out there, it's very hard to tell when or if this thing will come to an end. Now, talking about coming to an end, this is this the end of Bernie Sanders? Now, to be fair, I'm not a Sanders supporter, but I think Bernie has been having some votes and elections and other things stolen from the guy. And now we see this New York voter Bernie Sanders supporters are being forced to vote for Hillary delegates. Basically, I, I don't have time to go into the video, but if you watch the video, the guy documents how when you go to the site or you go to the uh, voter registration page, you have to vote for Hillary or, Ber or Bernie. Of course you do, but you also have to vote for six delegates, six. Now, Bernie has a total of five delegates, which means you can't vote for a straight ticket Bernie Sanders, you also have to vote for Hillary Clinton. And that's the type of fraud that they're slipping under the rug, hoping that you won't notice. Go watch that report. And also we'll end with this. 9-11 cover-up imploding as mainstream media is forced to report on a Saudi link. And with more on this, we have a special report from John Bowne. And stay tuned right after that for more special reports right here on the InfoWars Nightly News. How should the U.S. respond to uh, such a devastating? Well, I think they have to respond quickly and effectively. They have to find out exactly what the cause was, who did it, and they have to go after these people because uh, there is no other choice. Obviously, the war in Iraq is a big, fat mistake, all right? It took Jeb Bush, took him five days before his people told him what to say, and he ultimately said it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent $2 trillion, thousands of lives. We don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. On Monday, the Obama administration and the State Department said the release of the papers detailing Saudi involvement in the 9-11 attacks and its support for al-Qaeda would damage U.S. national security and endanger citizens living abroad. Both the Obama and Bush administrations have refused to release the papers stored in a guarded vault beneath Washington, D.C. The FBI has also refused to unseal the documents. It needs to be classified, former director of the FBI Robert S. Mueller said in a secret meeting. The White House has threatened to veto legislation that would release the documents. It's difficult to imagine a scenario where the president would sign it. White House spokesman Josh Earnest told Good reporters day, on Monday. He said the bill would oh, jeopardize you. international sovereignty and put the U.S. at a significant risk. Obama allies on Capitol Hill, including an unnamed Republican senator, have vowed to prevent the Senate from taking up the justice against sponsors of Terrorism Act. The bill would remove Saudi Arabia's immunity in federal court and allow victims of the 9-11 attacks to sue the kingdom. Governor Bush. How we doing? Good All right, good. Man. How you doing? I was wondering, would you be in favor of seeing the 28 pages that have been redacted from the 9-11 commission report? Would yeah, you sure. be one to see those released? Yeah, I'd like to see them. You got them? Uh, well, Andrew we, may have them. Hopefully we can get them. In order to have the bill move forward, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell would need to file procedural motions. 60 votes are required to have the bill move forward. 
After 9-11, it was clear that the Congress was going to be called upon uh, to conduct some form of an inquiry as to what happened. The decision by the leadership uh, was to combine the intelligence committees of the House and the Senate into a single body. For the first time in the history of the Congress, that, that had occurred. On April 10th, the former chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and co-chair of the bipartisan Joint Congressional Inquiry into the 9-11 attacks, Bob Graham, told CBS News he believes Saudi Arabia was behind the attacks. What I'm trying to tell you is, so what? We did not invent uh, corruption. Graham said support came from the Saudi government, charities, and rich people in the country. He said that support was downplayed because of the special relationship between the United States and the Saudi Arabian Kingdom. The evidence is overwhelming. For example, here's Donald Rumsfeld chopping at the bit to keep the momentum of the New World Order's tyrannical soft war moving. We have had an attack here in five years. Hell, the, the, the perception of the threat is so low in the society that uh, it's not surprising that the behavior pattern reflects a low threat assessment. And the same thing is in Europe, there's a low threat perception. Correction for that, I suppose, is, is an attack. Building 7, I often hear about. A no plane hit Building 7. Why did Building 7 come down? What do you tell people? What is Building 7? Building 7. I have no idea. I've never heard that. <laughs> we must never forget our fellow Americans that paid the ultimate price in a bid to end the American way, quarterbacked by a protected elite class now blackmailing the U.S. government by threatening to sell off $750 billion in U.S. assets. This obvious and inflated admission of guilt by the Saudis begs the question, how much are the 2,996 innocent fellow American lives that perished on 9-11-2001 worth to you? What's going on, Betty? Talk to me. Betty, are you there? John Bound for Infowars.com. This is a serious issue. And then about a week and a half ago, the big national news, World Net Daily covered it, Drudge covered it, Infowars covered it, Phyllis Schlafly, if you just joined us, there was an attempted coup inside our organization. Here's the headline from Dr. Corsi an attempted coup to fire her and to basically change the direction to put the powerful organization with great grassroots conservatives behind Ted Cruz. I think what happened to this important patriotic organization, what they attempted to do, uh, the import of it goes to the character of someone who wants to be president. So can you break down specifically what happened in the attempted, uh, what some have called mugging of uh, Eagle Forum? Well, the, the uh, attempt is uh, to use the my endorsement of of, uh, of uh, Donald Trump. You know, he came to St. Louis, had a big rally, and I introduced him, and I met him with him uh, before before he went on stage, and asked him to support the Republican platform, and he promised to support the Republican platform, and that's important to me. I've had a big hand in writing it. It's pro life. It's uh, pro marriage. It's a uh, pro and national sovereignty, which I, is very important to me. Military, it's not just strong enough uh, to have a, a good military. We've got to be superior. And then our enemies will respect us, and our uh, friends will rely on us. And anyway, he did, and so I endorsed him. And I, I guess there's about half of our people are for Cruz, and about half of them are for Trump. And uh, I didn't object to the one who endorsed uh, Cruz. I said, uh, you say you've got free speech. You can endorse to anybody you want. Well, I mean, I interview you every few months. You, you make really salient, central points that other pundits aren't even making. You're obviously super sharp. My grandmother's 90. She's super sharp. Has a lot of wisdom that I don't have as well. It's just so insulting to try to, in the dead of night, you know, steal the organization from you and just claim it's because you supported Donald Trump. It really shows uh, this rhino establishment desperately trying to dominate and control the grassroots. Uh, can you speak to specifically the tactics that were used and uh, what you think about uh, this whole event and what you think about the reports that Ted Cruz uh, operatives were involved? Well, I think they must have been 
because uh, all of this fight started uh, when uh, somebody came to me and gave me a list of about a dozen uh, ego uh, leaders, ego members, who were endorsing uh, Cruz. And uh, uh, they did it in a way it made it look like it was ego form doing it. But nevertheless, I decided not to say anything. Uh, let them do it. And uh, that free speech. And okay. Unfortunately, following that, uh, one of them made a robocall in behalf of Cruz. And uh, uh, a number of them have been using it. I, I suspect that they've been letting the Cruz campaign uh, use some of my list, which they have leaked to them. Wow, that's bombshell. I hadn't heard that yet directly from Phyllis Schlafly right now. Uh, she's researching. It looks like they had list. She got calls from other members. Yeah, and of course, the other thing they've done is to divide up my family. Uh, it's, uh, my daughter is, is a, uh, with the group that is leading me uh, in this, the assault on my leadership, and uh, they want to get rid of my sons, who are extremely valuable in my organization. One of uh, one of them is both a lawyer and an accountant, and he's he's very good with the uh, money. Uh, he makes he always errs on the state side of things. Well, Phyllis, that's amazing. I mean, uh, not just getting rid of you, claiming you were old, but now your son, a long-term member, lawyer, and accountant involved uh, in an organization right. that's, that's been so selfless. And then but we've got another another son they want to get rid of, and he's the one who's written a lot of these uh, meekest briefs that we have filed. Uh, with the Supreme Court in important cases, and we've been uh, we have a very wonderful collection of these briefs, and uh, you'll be interested in one of those briefs we filed. I don't remember which one it was. Uh, the ACLU filed a brief asking the court not to read Eagle Forms' brief. <laughs> remember that, <laughs> Phyllis. Getting back to the list, this is amazing. So, so people are getting well, robocalls. Somehow, Somehow they uh, they they did they had access to some of my list, and uh, I I don't think that was very nice. So you took the high road, let high level members of the Eagle Forum go out and and basically ignore what your main endorsement and just in your face endorse Cruz, as they were the Eagle Forum misrepresenting, uh, and then suddenly robocalls. As if Cruz, I guess, had already thought he was running Eagle Forum. Uh, are, are you going to formally ask them uh, to return any list or stop using your name? Uh, well, I'm trying to say that these other people are not representing Eagle Forum. Uh, I represent Eagle Forum, and uh, they tried to throw me out, but at any rate, I'm still here. And I intend to be here. I was reading Dr. Corsi, who I know has spoken to you uh, at World Net Daily about the kind of the chain of events, but specifically, break down for us, ma'am, if you can, and we're going to go to break, come back with five more minutes to finish up about the general election with you and, and your book being republished, but getting into the specifics. Well, if anybody wants to know why I endorse Trump, uh, you've got to read the book, A Choice, Not an Echo, because I have been fighting the kingmakers. The kingmakers are a lot of rich people who think they are appointed to uh, designate uh, who the Republican nominees are and who should be the, the president of the United States. And I don't think so. I think the grassroots are entitled to vote for the candidate. That That's what you've said on my show for 21 years. It's what you've been saying for 50 years. That's what you stand for right. is, the, is, is, is conservative populism. Uh, that's correct. And uh, the uh, kingmakers have had their way. You know, I tell people, I was in, I've been to every Republican convention since 1952, and I was there when the, the late, great uh, Senator Everett Dirksen, one of our greatest Republican speakers, said on the floor of the, of the convention, I've forgotten which one it was, uh, talking about the kingmakers then. We followed you before, and you led us down the road to defeat. Well, the kingmakers really don't care whether whether the Republicans or Democrats win, just so there are people they can pay off and control. And we're seeing that arrogance now, where even the Republican establishment, Mitch McConnell, uh, Paul Ryan, say, fine, we, we'll, we'll take Hillary over Donald Trump because they just want to maintain power. Yes, that, that is correct. And I want the grassroots to win, and I think we've got a chance with Trump. That's why they're scared to death of him. Well, it must be that uh, some 
somebody who betrayed me among our old people uh, gave uh, some of the list to Cruz because I found that the Cruz people were calling some of our eagles and uh, trying to line them up for Cruz. Well, I did not authorize that, and that's not on my plan at all. Uh, I, I think uh, Trump is the, the best bet because he's the one who would uh, really kick the kingmakers where it hurts. And, and uh, if you read a choice, not an echo, you'll know why I think they're the biggest threat to our country. And uh, they, need to be, uh, they need to be taken out of control and not allowed to run our country. Uh, the people who are, seem to try to be taking over have a lot of talent, but it's not enough to be able to run a good uh, business of company, which my daughter does. She's built a very fine business. Uh, it's not enough even to make a good speech, which uh, there are a lot of people who can do that. So to be clear, uh, you were positioning your daughter to take over as out of Eagle Forum. And at I guess, one time. Yeah, but at one time. And then I realized... Uh, kind of, uh, you know, a lot of our people wanted us to pick uh, Michelle Bachman, and uh, she uh, certainly has a lot of talent, very fine speaker and so forth, but she knew nothing about running an organization, and she knew nothing about politics out of her, outside of her own domain, and uh, I, I think it's, you got to love politics, which is what I do. So to be clear, you were already uh, 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 moving your daughter Anne out of the uh, you know succession to run the organization, and then she got mad and tried to coup. Is 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 that what happened? That's uh, pretty much what happened. Yes, and she lined up with some of the people who thought they could uh, get good jobs with being a form if they got rid of me. Have you talked to Anne since this happened? I've talked to her a few times, and she's trying to tell me she's just doing this for my benefit. Uh, but I don't need somebody to do something for my benefit. I've gotten along quite well all these years. Yeah, folks always try to take something away from somebody they didn't build for their benefit, Phyllis. Isn't that the way Bernie operates? Yeah, that's right. Smashing Pumpkins frontman Billy Corgan has been an outspoken opponent of the anti-free speech movement taking root here in America. He made a return visit to the Alex Jones show this week with a dire warning about the rising social justice warrior mob mentality. Once we lose free speech in this country, forget it. It won't matter what we think. When Drudge visited, he said, look, they're coming up to free speech next year. This is I, next year. I was listening that day, and I think that was probably one of the most important moments in the history of your uh, broadcasting. Because that shows you that he sees something, you see something, and together, you're, what, it's like, the, you know what they call that multiplier. One times one equals 100. You and Drudge on even the same wavelength, even if you guys don't agree about a lot of stuff, you guys on the same wavelength, that's the power. That's the force multiplier. Huge amplification. Right, but what is the, what is the common stitch there? Free speech. Once we give up free speech in this country, it is over. So, of course, whenever we do a big interview like this, it gets picked up by other media outlets instantly. Typically, they'll dissect it and, and try to tie people into conspiracy theorists. Now, of course, these outlets did use inflammatory words in order to bait people into their articles. Like, for instance, they all seem to have the same headline. Billy Corgan compares social justice warriors to the KKK. Many outlets were surprisingly fair with Corgan's take. Now, if Billy had talked about the threat of social justice warrior mob mentality even a year ago, he would have caught a lot of flack. But instead of scrutinizing everything that was said, large chunks of the conversation are actually left in verbatim, like here in this Pitchfork article, for instance. And this allows the reader to actually decide for themselves if there might be some merit to this discussion taking place rather than just outright telling them that it's racist. Now, it's the same with Rolling Stone, who did a particularly fair piece. They actually quoted some of the key points Corgan brought up, not just those that could be spun out of context to suit some agenda. Is the media finally beginning to recognize the very real threat to free speech that's posed by social justice warriors? I mean, they've been giving them front 
page splash news for the last year. But they're finally starting to see that that might not have been such a good idea. They're starting to see the writing on the wall. Just look at how free speech has been threatened in just the past few months. We've seen a reporter being kicked out of a safe space, sidewalk chalk, being banned from universities, spitting in people's faces, controversial speakers and iconic comedians are refusing to perform at universities lest the social justice mobs take them out. Uh, we're seeing people starting riots to shut down political rallies. And of course, there's the Kill Donald Trump rap song that's making the rounds. Now, of course, you still have some media outlets that want to cater to the social justice mob mentality for the clicks. Uh, here in this site that's too irrelevant as to remain unnamed. They say Billy Corgan is scared of the hashtag generation going after his free speech. And of course, they use some unsavory language there to describe Alex Jones. And in another article here, and they point out how Alex Jones is the guy who led the 9-11 is an inside job conspiracy theorist. Hello, have you picked up a newspaper in the past few days? Well, I think we're all going to find out just how I, high up in the government the 9-11 conspiracy actually goes. <sighs> but I digress. So, of course, these hit pieces are saying whiny Billy Corgan is just likening himself to people of color during the civil rights movement. But that's not what he's saying at all. He's pointing out that if you need to use fascist tactics to hammer down your ideology, then perhaps you need to take a look in the mirror. The Red Guards thought they were on the right side of history, too. I'm sure the Stasi did as well. Um, and yeah, the Klansmen probably thought their ideology needed to spit in someone's face. And then it goes on to point out how it's ironic that Billy Corgan and Alex Jones want to shut down these social justice warriors free speech when they're calling for free speech. But that's not what they're saying at all. They're not telling these people that they need to shut up. What they're saying is using fascist tactics to force everybody else to shut up is un-American and the country needs dialogue. This is we have to talk about controversial talk, topics in order to evolve, not a totalitarian shutdown of anything that might make someone uncomfortable. And this writer makes the argument that Donald Trump's free speech wasn't suppressed because the protesters that shut down his rally weren't agents of the state. But that's exactly what they are. That's what cultural Marxism produces, little agents of the state that go out policing everyone's speech. And here's the problem when it comes to banning offensive speech. Who gets to decide what is offensive and what is not? You see, in the case of Twitter, it's just a merry band of social justice warriors who, of course, make sure any anti-feminist sites are shut down while the kill all men hashtag trends into the ether. Now, yesterday I asked Billy Horgan what he thought about this double standard when it comes to censorship. You have to start by identifying that the most powerful thing in the world right now are these technocratic systems that are in place, search engines, uh, the way we connect on these, on these social platforms. Governments have either encouraged these things to come along or quickly realizes that they were the new element, arms of control. And so you have to ask yourself whether your participation in these systems is actually enslaving you. Then you have to drill down a little further and you have to want to ask questions about um, if what you're doing and participating in is, is truly uh, as open as it seems. So if Twitter, for example, is full of people of a diverse set of opinions and you feel like, hey, it's, the, it's, it's capitalist, it's my idea versus yours, who tweets more, who gets more retweets, who says the right incendiary thing, who does the right mean, great. That, that's America, great. And I would only argue, you know, where, where do you cross the line? And you see it all the time. I mean, uh, uh, Infowars puts up articles. Uh, as somebody who's in the in the world, and I have to watch what I say. When you see a page that's literally, and the page is the Facebook page is assassinate Donald Trump, and and I believe Facebook comes out and says that doesn't violate our standards and practices. Yeah. Okay, that's where so, somebody like myself has to ask: Is my participation in the Facebook system, and I would call it a system, am I actually encouraging something which, as an American, I find offensive? Mm -hmm. And I also find it offensive that a business would support. You can call. I would have no problem with the page that said Donald Trump's a racist. Donald Trump's a homo. Uh, Donald Trump's a homophobe because because that's just opinion. The minute you talk about killing someone, <clears throat> sorry, that's where you need to step in as a business. And say I will not support that. So why does that? Why is that okay? 
But you can imagine what page you could create on Facebook today, and there would be calls for you to never work here at InfoWars ever again. Right. That's, that's where it gets funky. So you have to be sophisticated enough to look at those systems and say, is my participation encouraging something that I know deep down is intrinsically not only flawed, but counterintuitive to what I, what I want to be part of? So be on the lookout for more excerpts from that interview coming next week. Billy Corgan delivers some illuminating commentary on the anti-free speech movement here in the United States, as well as many more bombshell topics. So that's coming your way in the coming days. I'm Leanne McAdoo reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. That's veteran Denver police officer Charles Jones IV smashing an unarmed suspect in the face six times. Officers accused of using excessive force on a suspect and then trying to erase the evidence. I'm, I'm observing what they're doing and they're arresting me. I don't understand what's going on. A community rates low on an information scale when the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? How can you ask such a question? What difference at this point does it make? When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in the community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. There are actions I have the legal authority to take as president that will help make our immigration system more fair and more just. Tonight, I'm announcing those actions. What I say goes, see? I'm the law around here. <laughs> he came, he saw, he died. <laughs> yes, in modern warfare, our military leaders are finding that words and ideas are highly effective weapons. We just have to be repetitive about this. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. We are trained to deceive if we have to. You really don't have to trust me. You shouldn't trust me. In fact, by my actually participating in that, I will taint the news. In communities of this kind, despotism stands a good chance. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Well, okay, Miss Youth, well, we're, we're going to do everything we can to help you. <laughs> Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. <laughs>